Chapter Twenty Two of the Friendship of Anne, a story by Ellen Douglas Deland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It is difficult in real life to keep up with the flight of time and to grasp the fact that the weeks, months, or years have flown by since some well remembered event or that actually we are all somewhat older than we once were and that the boys and girls we knew in our youth but have not seen since are now men and women of mature years but in reading a book one has but to turn a page and presto the schoolgirl of yesterday doing her examples in arithmetic is now a young woman of twenty-three and the college boys are out in the big maelstrom of business and all the world is grown up it was summer to be exact it was the very end of june and once more the scene was the grand central station in new york crowds of passengers were standing in line at the ticket offices or hurrying through the doors which led to their trains just as they had done the day sydney stuart went to the wickersham school and they had been doing without interruption ever since for a railway station is perhaps the one place in the world which never knows emptiness or rest again a group of persons had gathered to await the calling of a train for kingsbridge it consisted of sydney stuart and phil Anne talbot and alec tracy they were on their way to visit Alec's mother, who was giving a house party. Anne looked very much as she did when she was a schoolgirl. Perhaps she was even prettier. Her animated face, which changed with every passing mood or even thought, was full of charm. She was very tall, and, as usual, she was well-dressed. Sydney was tall, too, but her stature was not so noticeable as Anne's. The years had made a greater change in her face than in that of her friend. Life was a more serious affair for Sydney than it had yet proved for Anne. Her mother had died and Margaret had married, so Sydney kept house for her three brothers and Amabel. Bob was engaged. He had not yet made his fortune, but his marriage was to take place before very long and it would make considerable difference in Sidney's housekeeping when he no longer contributed his share towards the family expenses. However, no one thought of that, for they were all delighted that he was going to be happy himself and give them a new sister whom they liked and were glad to welcome to the family circle. The problems which Sidney had already been called upon to meet had given her a look of thoughtfulness but this expression had added to the beauty of her face in which the color came and went with the same frequency that had been such a source of amusement to the girls at school it was evident to the most casual observer that alec tracy thought her very pretty indeed for he seldom looked at any one else when she was near he was carrying her bag and umbrella now, and Phil had Anne's. "'Do you remember the first time we ever met?' said Anne, laughing. "'I left my bag on the floor here, and you ran after me with it, Phil.' "'I should think I did,' rejoined Philip. "'It took all the courage I possessed to do it. "'No one would ever have suspected that. "'You had the assurance of a man of the world.' I was tremendously impressed. I was with Dolly and Gertrude King, I remember, and they teased me unmercifully about it. Oh, how funny it is to think of those old days. Sid, do you remember your first journey to Kingsbridge? They had reached the train and were in their seats when Anne leaned over and asked Sidney this question. I do indeed. I was so afraid of you all but i had picked out you as the person i most wanted to know you came and spoke to bertha macy and me after we changed at the junction oh bertha macy what a time we had with her 
she certainly was about the limit said alec i shall never forget her that night at our house when she and old mary sat on the stairs i wonder what has become of her since when have you been so interested in the fair bertha asked anne but i could tell you the latest news of her as you are so anxious to know i met her on the other day on broadway she was walking with a very elegant looking creature a man she had a big bunch of violets and conscious expression she scarcely deigned to recognize me just gave her eyelids a sort of a flicker i have been practicing it before the glass ever since when i wish to just escape giving the cut direct i am going to flicker my eyelids this way she then gave them an exhibition of her new accomplishment that was most effective i could tell you more about her than that said sydney i met her in a store to my surprise she came up and spoke to me i was perfectly amused for usually she flickers at me too the whole thing was so funny she put out two fingers at me which i meekly received oh miss stewart she said i haven't seen you since i left wickersham school but you haven't changed in the least how are all the girls is anne talbot engaged yet i said not that i knew of mercy she said that must be a fearful trial to her and always made such a dead set at all the boys oh how outrageous cried anne laughing and for you to repeat it sydney before these two boys what else nothing more about you but she asked about the others and i told her we were all going to kingsbridge to stay with mrs tracy and have a sort of a reunion i wish you could have seen her face but she said she always thought kingsbridge such a stupid place and was alec tracy as full of airs as ever this turned the laugh on alec who enjoyed it thoroughly himself was that all she said asked anne oh no she told me she was going abroad and that count von somebody or another was to be of the party that must have been he i saw her with he looked like a foreigner of course i think that was the reason she spoke to me she wanted us to know oh you girls said alec how you do pick each other to pieces well i like that said anne who in spite of being grown up and in spite of her mother's disapproval still lapsed into slang phrases occasionally as if you were not the one who always gives a dig at bertha macy sydney we won't tell him any more gossip he'll be sorry enough not to hear about it. you know whom i'll tell you about it when we change at the junction let us arrange to sit together then how natural that sounds arranging to sit together when we get to the junction just as we always did in going back to school and finally the junction was reached but by that time the arrangement had been forgotten or at least it was overlooked and phil took his seat by anne and alec by sydney quite as a matter of course surely kingsbridge had never looked lovelier than it did that june evening the sun would not be setting for an hour yet beyond the distant hills and its slanting rays fell upon the winding river and shone through the elm trees now in the full foliage of summer which arced and met above the village streets the gardens too for which the old town was famous were at the height of summer bloom and roses of all shades larkspur mignonette geraniums and all the flowers that grow massed together in old-fashioned luxuriance and without the modern regard for schemes of color filled the air with fragrance there could not be a lovelier 
more restful place at which to arrive after a long day in a railroad train the tracy's carriage was waiting at the station with the same thomas to drive the bays who had driven for so many years the roomy carriage was large enough for all and presently they were spinning along beneath the elms and over the wide smooth road to mrs tracy's house she was waiting for them on the piazza and with her were two persons who quickly disappeared within doors as the carriage turned into the avenue which led up to the house before the travellers had time to see who they were in fact their presence had made no impression ever upon the newcomers who were entirely absorbed in the pleasure of getting there they lingered for a few minutes on the piazza and then mrs tracy suggested that the girls might like to go to their rooms and refresh themselves after the journey we shall have supper earlier than usual tonight," she said for i know you must be hungry and you are to have the yellow room and sydney the blue you both know just where they are and how to find them the two girls ran upstairs mrs tracy followed more sedately each one turned to the room designated and each one paused on the threshold with an exclamation or rather a scream of delight seated in anne's room was dolly fearling in sydney's elsie brent where did you come from cried anne sydney who do you think is here but who do you think is here called sydney and then such a greeting ensued such a hubbub of laughter and talk that the boys came running upstairs to find out what had happened are we going to find more of the old crowd waiting in our rooms mother said alec i think it wouldn't be a bad idea to have fred up in my den wait a little longer said mrs tracy i should have managed it the way if i had had my way but unfortunately fred could not leave in time to get here before you he and hugh will be here to-morrow but dolly how did you manage to keep it from me that you were coming asked anne i saw you two weeks ago and have heard from you lots of times since oh it is easy enough to keep things out of a letter said dolly it is only when i am with you that i can't resist telling you things i have been staying with elsie you know and she has kept a strict watch over me mrs tracy planned it all and it worked in beautifully with elsie's invitation to me i have had such a lovely time in cambridge we went to class day and it was simply perfect we came up here yesterday in the meantime elsie was telling sydney very much the same thing her great brown eyes followed sydney as she moved about the room she had become a fine-looking woman and although she could never be called pretty her face was full of character she looked much older than her years but she was one whose face would change but little as she grew older and she would probably seem as youthful as thirty or even forty as she did at twenty-three oh i am so glad you are here exclaimed sydney pausing long enough in her preparations for supper to throw her arms around elsie's neck and give her a good hug you are just the same as ever you quiet undemonstrative old elsie i know you are glad to see me and yet you have scarcely kissed me oh elsie do you remember the first night we ever spent in this room the day alec rescued us and carried you in a dead faint into the house that was so romantic by all the laws of romance you and he ought to have fallen in love with each other long ago thank you kindly said elsie with a humorous look in her eye it is just as well we haven't i think from what i hear from both fred and dolly alec has other plans 
Fred and Dolly must know a great deal, rejoined Sydney, applying herself with as much acidity to the tying of a belt ribbon. Elsie, do you remember what a state I was in about Anne when we stayed here the first time? I thought if I did not get back her friendship, life would really not be worth living. She certainly was fascinating then, just as she is now. I was thinking about all that only the other day, said Elsie. Do you know that really the friendship of Anne has made a great difference to a lot of people? It was because Bertha Macy was so anxious for it that we had all the trouble in school, and then you felt so badly about it that you and I became friends. I don't believe we ever should have done so otherwise. And it has had more effect even than all that, said Sidney. She and Phil have been friends ever since he first came up to see Mrs. Braithwaite. You know Mrs. Tracy asked her here to supper the night Phil was here, and I think meeting her had just as much influence over him at that time as the other affair did. I mean the discovery that Mrs. Braithwaite was so fond of him. That, of course, was the saving of him. But Anne's coming into his life at the same time knocked all the morbidness out of him. She is so gay and light-hearted and full of fun and life. Oh, Elsie, I can't help wishing sometimes that she was not so rich or Phil not so poor. Why should that make any difference? Why isn't it better than if they were both very rich or both very poor? Oh, I don't know, but it does. Your way of putting it sounds much more sensible. But young men, the right kind of young men, seem to feel they can't ask rich girls to marry them. At least I know Phil feels that way. If I were very rich, said Elsie slowly, and the man I loved and who loved me were very poor, I know I should think it a poor kind of love of his that didn't have sufficient trust in me to allow him to ask me to marry him. Why should a man care what the world says, if the girl he loves understands? Money ought to be a blessing, but if it prevents Phil from speaking to Anne, it seems to me more like a curse. Well, perhaps it will all come right in time, said Sidney. He is so young yet, though he seems older than any of us. He is so dear and unselfish and thoughtful for others. There never was such a brother as Phil, but I would gladly give him up to Anne. She has always had so much attention that she might marry almost anyone. There are at least two New York men who I know are tremendously in earnest, but Anne just laughs and goes on her way. And there was someone else I happened to know from an other city, but I can't help thinking that it is really Phil whom she cares for, though she is so proud that she shields herself behind all her fun and laughter, so that not many people would guess it. I am sure it will all come right, Sidney. You needn't worry about that. I am not worrying, at least not about that. I am wondering how Amabel and Murray are getting on without me. Dear little Amabel hated so to have me go, although she is very proud of being left in charge, and she is going to pour out the boys' coffee herself. Margaret is going to look after them, but Margaret is so absorbed in her own family that we don't take much satisfaction in her. There, I am ready at last, and we ought to go down. Oh, you dear Elsie, I am so glad you are here. The next morning, Sidney and Phil went to see Mrs. Braithwaite. Both had been in Kingsbridge several times since Sidney finished school. 
Philip's visits being for the sole purpose of seeing the little lady, whose affection for him had deepened with the years. They found her in the garden. She was in a dainty white dress, and a lace scarf was draped over her head. Seated in a rustic armchair, surrounded by the masses of roses now in full bloom, she looked like some rare picture. The old house formed a gloomy background. But both it and the place itself were in a better state of repair than when Sydney first visited the blind woman. She seemed more like other people now, less remote and odd, and it was undoubtedly caused by the new interest that had come into her life in the person of Philip. Her grandson's friend while he could not in the nature of things be to her what braith had been had become very dear to her and she looked forward to his coming as she would have done to that of another grandson sydney stayed with them but a short time as alec tracy had asked her to go on the river and it was not long before he called for her when they were left alone, Mrs. Braithwaite put out her hand and touched Phil's arm. "'My boy,' she said, "'how goes it with you?' "'Pretty well, Mrs. Braithwaite,' he answered. "'Of course, in any profession it is uphill work at first, but I think I've got it in me. I know you have it in you. I have been told so. You need not think i have sat here idle all these years hearing nothing what have you been doing and hearing he asked his manner was very tender with her he loved her not only because she was brace grandmother but because she had been such a good friend to himself oh i have made inquiries i have my ways of finding out i happen to know from some one high in authority that a certain mr philip stuart is sure some day to be a very excellent architect in fact he is already spoken of as one of our most talented young men it was sad that she could not see the quick color rise in phil's face and the happy expression of his eyes when she said this but she heard his voice I am afraid you are too much prejudiced in my favor, he said. You read more meaning into Mr. Dennison's words than he ever meant. No, I don't, and I have heard the same from others, too. And now, Phil, there is something else I wish to speak of. Have you said anything to Anne yet? He moved quickly. He almost rose to his feet. Then he sat down again, and when he spoke his voice was very quiet. No, Mrs. Braithwaite, I haven't. I can't speak to her. As I told you before, I can't ask a girl like Anne, who could marry anyone, to wait years and years for a penniless fellow like me. But does she want to marry anyone? I, I hope not. Ah, my dear that is just it you hope not and yet you have not the courage to go to her and ask her to wait for you for that is what it is phil you are cowardly about it although you know and you know anne knows that you do not want her money and would rather that she had none you are afraid of what the world will say you do not think of her side of the matter. Would she not rather that you tell her that you love her, if, as I think is the case, she cares for you? At any rate, you can at least ask her, and if she does not, take it like a man. I know someone once whose life was spoiled because she had so much money that her lover was afraid to ask her to marry him. I want you to do it, Phil. I am getting old, and I want to see you engaged to Anne before I die. Promise me. And before he left her that morning, he had promised. He went to see her every day during his visit in Kingsbridge, 
but nothing more was said between them on the subject he told her all that they were doing and the good times they were having and she listened eagerly as full of interest as though she were herself young and vigorous she asked no questions not even of sydney who often ran in to see her it was a project that was very dear to her heart and she had made certain plans in connection with it that were not to be spoken of until all was arranged but which she was very desirous of seeing carried into effect the house party had been invited to stay a week which was all the time that the young men could spare from their professions or business and the girls too had other engagements to fill it was a week of an unalloyed pleasure for all never had the weather been so beautiful and day after day dawned clear and not too warm for the thorough enjoyment of all the picnics drives river trips and good times that were planned and successfully carried out the day before they were to leave phil came again to braithwaite hall it was late in the afternoon and again the little lady was sitting in her garden this time anne was with him he knelt on the grass beside the rustic chair and took the dear old hands in his you are my best friend he said have you asked her phil i have asked her and she has come herself to tell you the answer anne is here mrs braithwaite the little lady rose and held out her arms my dear she said softly you have made me very happy ah uh, no mrs braithwaite said anne in her quick impulsive way it is you who have made me happy phil has told me how you made him promise to speak to me and that he never would have done it until he had made his fortune if it had not been for you wasn't he a foolish boy and if it made any difference which of us has the money mrs braithwaite you scarcely know me and yet what a good friend you have been to me will you always be my friend yes my dear said the little lady then she turned towards phil and took his hand though i have not met her often phil i know very well what anne is i hope i may always have the friendship of anne and i am very very glad my dear boy that you are to have something even more precious than her friendship and while this was taking place in the old garden alec and sydney floating down the river in his canoe dreamed that all the world was made for them alone and that this summer day had no other purpose in its dawning save to bring them happiness and the sky was blue and the west wind stirred the leaves and the little birds sang joyously and life was young and very beautiful and full of hope End of chapter 22 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. End of the Friendship of Anne, a story by Ellen Douglas DeLand.